Welcome to Quick Bites, sponsored by San Jose State University's College of Humanities and Arts through two of our initiatives, H&A in Action and H&A in San Jose. In collaboration with the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Library, we are excited to bring you this forum for urgent news, where SJSU faculty members discuss current events and provide expert insights into the news that everyone's talking about. Free and open to the public, join the conversation each month by registering to watch the live stream and submitting your questions. On behalf of myself, Shannon Miller, and Catherine D. Harris, Director of Public Programming, we welcome you to listen in on today's conversation between Ali Guaranos Luna, Senior NASA Aerospace Engineer, and Michael Kaufman, Professor of Astronomy, about the launch of the Webb Space Telescope and all of its possibilities. Coming to you virtually, live streamed from the Hammer Se Theater Center Mercury Newsroom, we invite you to post questions and conversations in the Vimeo chat. Hi, Ali. <laughs> Hello, Michael. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. Nice. Yes, the same here. Do you want to tell people listening today a little bit about your background and uh, experience with spacecraft? Sure, sure. Uh, so my name is Ali Guarneros Luna. I'm, uh, actually, I'm a professor at San Jose State uh, in the aerospace department, and I've been working for NASA for over a decade. And I've been building uh, technology for demonstrations uh, New, well, technology to demonstrate uh, for new missions that we are planning, uh, you know, from the NASA side. Um, and we utilize the space station uh, rockets and suborbital rockets and balloons to mature that technology. So, yes. Cool. What about you? <laughs> so I'm a, a professor of astronomy at San Jose State University. Um, actually, long ago, I was a postdoctoral fellow at NASA Ames, right oh, where cool. you are. So we overlap <laughs> somewhat. Yeah. Uh, and my research uh, involves understanding the evolution of baby stars. Oh, wow. Uh, and understanding the clouds of gas that they form from and what happens to those chemically and uh, dynamically yeah. um, as they evolve. And part of my work has involved using a whole range of telescopes that have been in interesting places. So I've used at least three telescopes in space, including the Hubble, oh, wow. the Infrared Space Observatory, and the Herschel Space Observatory. But you, you were uh, hands-on in the, those systems, huh? Well, the interesting thing is, and we'll come to this as we talk, is that uh, for most astronomers, mm -hmm. they don't get their hands dirty with, yes, the, with the machines. <laughs> we let the engineers put the things together. <laughs> Uh, and although there are some astronomers involved in, uh -huh. in uh, calibrating and commissioning yes. these missions, um, most astronomers who use uh, these amazing scientific instruments um, don't actually get involved in developing the technology. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really interested to learn from you <laughs> about what that experience is like. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yes. So I don't know, do we want to give some update about what happened to the James Webb Telescope sure. right now? Sure. Since uh, it was launched back in December yeah. of last year, right? Christmas time? Christmas Day, I think, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was launched uh, on one of the biggest rockets that's, right. that's available. But the telescope itself is so big mm -hmm. that it wouldn't fit. That's right. Uh, completely deployed in that <laughs> rocket. So. Uh, there were some amazing engineering things that had to happen to fold up the telescope yes. for launch. Uh, and then once it was launched, it had to be unfurled. And, yes. uh, and they're actually still in the process of getting the telescope ready for doing observations. So yeah. uh, cool, cool stuff going on. Should we um, show our audience a couple of little oh, yes. things on here? Absolutely. I mean, um, as you can see, actually, this is a model made by Mike. Uh, <laughs> Michael, from uh, actually the website at NASA has uh, this cool, you know, uh, cut out, right, that you mm -hmm. just said, and, and so he made it, and I encourage anybody who has children to, you know, to do it, and it will be a great introduction for children to start looking at the science and technology, or, you know, just in general, be curious about uh, looking at um, astronomy, right? But uh, as you can see, the James Webb Telescope has 18 mirrors, right? Mm -hmm. And it's about, um, which Oops. are, yeah turn this so we can see it a little <laughs> bit more. Yes, and it has a focal point, which is, 
You can probably explain more than I am, you know, on the focal point aspect, but, you know, this is where the light comes in and uh, it gets absorbed in the back of the machine, right? Yeah, so the, um, the primary mirror, which is the big mirror part that's made up of those 18 segments, yes. that's the, the big business part of the telescope. Its job is to collect as much light as possible yeah. from astronomical objects. Um, and then that light gets focused onto what's called uh, a secondary mirror. Mm. And then the light from the secondary mirror gets uh, directed through a small hole in the center of the primary to the back of the telescope where all the scientific instruments are located. Mm. And there's four, right? Yeah. There's, yeah. The, there's a mid infrared. Uh, th there's one called Miri. Yeah. And then there's another infrared um, instrumentation. And then you have, the inf they, then you have two infrared instruments and each one plays a role uh, in the whole observation. That's right. So the, um, the instruments do different things with the light that comes in. Um, some of the instruments are used to make images of the sky. So to literally take a picture of something in deep space. Um, and some of them are what are called spectroscopy devices. And what they do is they break the light up into it's different colors or different wavelengths, and that allows us to tell things about how far uh, close there, how far away something is, how hot it is, what chemical elements it's made of. Yeah, that's very um, cool. It's that's our really um, yeah, that detailed is, tool for astronomy. And that's really cool because when we look at the stars that are really far from us, and we want to know whether there's possibility of life, we can actually tell by the composition of the you know of the atmosphere, right? And this uh, telescope can probably give us some information, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then we have these, uh, which they're like- There's five of them. Five right? of them, different layers, which um, are um, useful, actually very important to the telescope because it prevents the telescope to be hot. Uh, actually, uh, it's a, if we- Yeah, you want Yeah. So it's actually orbiting the, the Earth this way, so the Earth is in this side, and it's preventing the heat coming in and making the system be cool, cooler, right? right. So the, it is very important for the spacecraft, uh, the telescope, I mean, to be cooled because the instrumentation is to, you know, operate in really cold temperatures. You right. know, uh, I think minus. It's about Fahrenheit. it's about uh, seventy degrees below. Uh, sorry, seventy degrees above absolute zero. Yes. So very. <laughs> Which cold. is in the carbon, you know region uh, measurements. So yes, it's very cold. And, and so the sun and the earth are, you know, in the opposite end. So we want to make sure that the instrumentation is cold at all times, right? And the, yeah, and one of the main reasons why cold is so important for this telescope is that the telescope is designed to collect infrared light, which is sometimes called yes, heat so. radiation. Um, a telescope like the Hubble Space Telescope was primarily designed to detect visible light, the same mm -hmm. light that our eyes are able to see. Um, but uh, infrared light is emitted by objects that are much cooler yes. than, uh, say, the sun, yes. right? And the, um, it turns out that any object that has a temperature emits infrared light. Yeah. And so um, imagine you were um, out at nighttime trying to look at something really faint in the sky, but your own eyes were giving off lots of light. <laughs> it would be really hard. It would be really blinding yes. for, um, for you. And so the, the whole reason to cool down the telescope is to keep it from emitting infrared light so it doesn't distract it from the infrared coming from yes, elsewhere in space. And you can actually observe. And, and that is the other reason why I think one of the key reasons is to that actually was placed in the L2, which is the Lagrange point, is that is the perfect distance and actually um, uh, to, to block the sun and the Earth front, right? right? So it was a very nice orbit to, you know, to actually place the telescope in there and, and keep it uh, away from the sun and the Earth in a distance that it was uh, safe for it, right? right? Yeah, so. So when I look at this, um, amazing machine <laughs> that is designed to do things like look back at the oh, beginning right. of the universe. Yes. Um, as a scientist who's used these amazing engineering feats, I'm really curious to hear what the experience is like as, an, as a spacecraft engineer mm -hmm. when a scientist comes to you and says, 
here's what I want to do. <laughs> Where do you even start? Yeah, uh, that's, what's that experience like? Yeah, that's very, that's a good question. I, you know, working with scientists, um, it, it is a completely, you have to, me as an engineer, I have to take it as, you know, you're my customer, right? You're coming to me and asking me, you know, how do we make certain instrumentation to, you know, to look or to function in a certain way that here on Earth, it, it's not, it's, gonna, it's not going to work the same or it will work in a different way, right? And so a lot of times I feel like I'm a reporter asking questions to the mm -hmm. scientists and like trying to understand, you know, what they want to accomplish. Because a lot of times, you know, when we write down, you know, or ideas or what we think of are completely different when we try to show it to somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, my job, I think, in that perspective is to understand what is it that you really need or want for the science that you want to um, get and then start writing down requirements and then try to work with the PI or, you know, the scientist to really understand uh, whether it is, you know, it will be okay. Because a lot of times when you look at these... Um, James Webb Telescope. Uh, it took us. It took about 30 years for us to build the, you know, to, to come, to create all the concepts that it needed to be created to build the machine. I mean, just just to give you one factor, the you know, the mirrors were made out of beryllium, right? And they had to be like really uh, be flattened, and then they had to be coated with uh, gold. And that whole process was, n I mean, it was not invented or. Mm -hmm. Produce so they, you know, the engineers wasted years to develop that technique, you right. know, and and they put it together, and then not only do it once, but you have to do it <laughs> many times. times right? Yes, and it has to be perfect because they all have to be the same, right? And so a lot of times is looking at what technologies out there that we can utilize, uh, or do we have to actually make and and develop so we can actually put the you know, in this case, James Webb Telescope. And that whole process takes years. And also a key factor is the generation, right? Because, I mean, 30 years is a lifetime for anybody, right? And so mm -hmm. if you start when you uh, you were just fresh out of high uh, school into a mission like this, over time, you know, by the time it ends, you're like probably going to be, you know, 30 50, right? If you right. think about you're 20, you know, or 21, you're going to be 50. So a lot of times it's a whole process of not only keeping the, the, the folks that started at the beginning, but also, you know, bringing fresh new grads into the process. Right. So it will continue because I'm thinking about this is only three years, but sometimes it takes longer than that, right? right. And you want to keep folks that are, you know, able to continue the mission all the way throughout through the mission operations, which we hoping that at least 20, 10 years, uh, it will provide science for us, right? Mm -hmm. So it's so important for us to not only do the instrumentation, the technology that we need to, but also keep the human capital, which we call, you know, is, is the students, you know, the, the engineers, the scientists, you know, the pipeline coming in, right? right. And it's so important. Can I, can I ask you yeah. a follow-up about that? So, um, you know, a project like this, like you said, is like a, a once-in-a-generation yes. kind of project. 30, 30 years of someone's career That's could right. be spent on this. Um, but if you're, uh, say, a young student or a young, uh, a young graduate, um, you, you could see, like, getting involved in this at one point, and then your whole career is that. Yes. Um, what kinds of things are available for people to work on that are shorter term than that, right? I mean, you, you work on little satellites, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. And actually, not just satellites, but technology development. So I, I, I personally, because I'm teaching the Sound State, I encourage my students to get involved in projects that are like building rockets, you know, suburban rockets or like amateur rockets that are like, you know, 11 feet or uh, you know, taller, and it's not just the small little thing, but, you know, bigger ones, because it gives you the hands-on activity and also understand uh, the requirements, and you're able to acquire skills that maybe when you graduate, then you can apply it in the, you know, mm -hmm. missions like this. And in fact, I did, had one student, uh, his name was Jason, well, he is Jason, uh, and actually he was at San Jose State, and we started with uh, doing the small CubeSats, uh, and I was working at Ames at that time too, so he was helping me. He was my intern at the time, and we were developing this. Uh, we call it this exobray, 
you know, which in another occasion I can explain all that. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was doing his bachelor's degree in aerospace. And, and, I, and I saw him graduate with the bachelor's degree and then with a master's. And then he ended up going to Maxar, which is uh, uh, a company over here in the Bay Area where they develop big satellites. And then he ended up, uh, a few years later, he ended up getting a job in orthogrammer, actually integrating the, the spacecraft and testing it. And for me, it was amazing because, you know, when I saw him, like, I want to say like five years, but it was probably more than that, um, you know, and going through that path and then see him, you know, be there, you know, next to the spacecraft, you know, right. and then sending me pictures, you know, of when it was uh, being tested or integrated. I mean, it's amazing, you know, the work that uh, we do as a professors and the impact. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, uh, it's something that, yes, you know, if you, especially at the university level, if we can get them into look at small projects that they can do, develop within a year or two, you know, then they can get the skills and then, you know, infuse and themselves. And then work on something yeah. like this. Yes. Very cool. Yeah, so, and I also, I, I also note that um, talking about some of the capabilities of the what, James Webb Telescope, I mean, th there's, there are four subjects that we're looking at, you know, yeah. ro you know, the, from the James Webb Telescope science perspective, right? Right. So yeah. the, um, it's interesting because the, um, the Webb Telescope um, was designed very early on to be a machine that was able to look at galaxies very, very far away. Yeah. And um, maybe I could talk a little bit about the science that goes behind that. No, absolutely. In a, in I'm second. interested to know. But the, um, as I mentioned earlier, the telescope um, is uh, designed to collect infrared light. And infrared light, um, as I mentioned as well, is generally thought of as light that's given off by objects that are uh, low temperature. Um, so um, the floor of this room is giving infrared off, your forehead is giving yeah. off infrared. Um, but galaxies, which are made of stars, have much, much hotter objects in them. And they emit light in the visible part of the spectrum and even in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. But galaxies that are really, really far away um, emit that light, but the light takes a long, long time yeah. to travel to us. Um, in fact, when we collect light from it, we're seeing light uh, from objects as they were in the past. And the other thing that happens is that the, the universe is expanding. Yes. And as that light travels through an expanding universe, the light waves get stretched out. Mm -hmm. And so light that started off as visible light in the early universe, when it reaches us, is in the infrared. Yeah. And that's why Webb was designed to collect infrared. So one of its main science objectives is to look at galaxies in the early universe, galaxies that are just being born, galaxies that we don't have the sensitivity to, think, to detect right now. You know, as of a month ago, <laughs> um, and collecting the light from them and doing the things that I was talking about, figuring out how hot the galaxies are, how massive they are, what chemicals they're made of, yeah. and so on. But that same infrared capability allows us to look at the dusty cocoons where stars are forming in closer by galaxies mm -hmm. and even in our own galaxy. And it also allows us to study the, um, the composition of the atmospheres of planets around other stars. So you've probably heard about exoplanets. Yes. <laughs> exoplanets um, is uh, the study of star, or planets, I'm sorry, that are around stars other than the sun. Mm -hmm. And when the James Webb Space Telescope was first conceived about 30 years ago, no exoplanets had been discovered. Yeah. This whole field of study didn't exist yet. So um, it wasn't until 1995 that the first one was discovered. And then over the last 15 years or so, we've yeah. discovered about four or 5,000 more yes. of them. So one of the, I would say, new science goals for the James Webb Space Telescope is to study in detail um, these planets are around other stars mm -hmm. and not only take images of them, but also look at the spectrum of their atmospheres to tell if they have oxygen or water or Amazing. carbon dioxide yeah. in them yeah. and really get to know these planets, not just as little dots ordering other yeah. stars, but as, as worlds in yeah. their own. And then the final thing um, is that that same incredible 
infrared sensitivity allows us to study very small, very cold objects in our own neighborhood. So um, comets in our solar system, um, small icy objects that orbit further out than Pluto. Right. Yeah. Um, and so those are the main uh, science goals. And so it goes from everywhere from the very, very early universe all the way into our own neighborhood. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, I know that a lot of people are probably thinking, will these tell us, you know, about life in other planets? It might not be able to tell us really life existed, but it will give us a really good indication. Right. right. Because, right. you know, we will be able to discern whether these exoplanets uh, actually can, you know, be a host for life, right? Exactly. Exactly. And what can we imagine for that, right? Yep. Yeah. And the things we usually think of when we think of life are water, That's which is right. one of the things that we can detect in the atmospheres of these planets. And then um, it turns out if you have oxygen, free oxygen in the atmosphere of a planet, that's probably an indication that some kind of respiration is going on there because planetary atmospheres like to be things like carbon dioxide, yeah. not things like oxygen. So that's one of the questions we can start to answer with the web as well. That is super cool. That is yeah. definitely cool. Um, it's all about where things came from, right? <laughs> yes. How did galaxies form? What are planets like? What are the remnants of our solar system like? Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's an incredible machine. It is, it is. I mean, and that's, that is what, you know, we, we hope to, um, you know, to get the images from it, you know, the, it will be so interesting. And also, you know, obviously for me as an engineer, uh, it's super exciting because I, when I saw it, you know, back in December, you know, the launch and then we start getting, you know, it had to be unfold, right? Because it was, it was not definitely like this. Right. <laughs> it was completely folded. And then, you know, every step of the way that is happening is so uh, amazing to me. You know, the unfurl of the, you know, he, he, uh, the shield, you know, is, is definitely something very uh, important because, you know, it never happened. How many times we have to actually test it, you know, mm -hmm. not only test to make sure that it worked, but, you know, you build it, right? And then make sure that you build it and, and then it furls, you know, because it was all folded and then you had to unfold it. And, you know, we have to make, make sure that this machine actually will be able to, to survive, you know, the space, you know, with mm -hmm. where it is right now. In L2, one section is getting heat up, you know, all the sun, you know, temperature, you know, the heat, the radiation is coming uh, to one end. And then the other one is super cold. So you, if you can imagine being um, in the freezer, one half of your body and the other <laughs> one, you know, in, uh, in front of the heater, right? And then, you know, try to figure out, you know, how do you, you regulate that temperature in, yeah. in your body. I mean, it's, it's difficult, right? And so we have to come up with, uh, you know, ways to, to do it and to ensure that the materials will be not, you know, expand or compress because of the temperature differences. And then, the, you know, also be able to communicate to the ground because once the, it, the spacecraft gets commissioning and uh, it start getting these images of these stars and everything, we need to get that data and it needs to be processed, right? And mm -hmm. it's so important to get that data because that is the whole reason we put it in space, right? right? And, uh, and it is uh, about, I think, what is it, 10, 10 megabytes? Or yeah, I, I forgot, the, I forgot the, already. Yeah, I think we, we decided the, the bit rate was about 10 megabits per second. Per second, yes. And about uh, something like 100 gigs a day yeah. it's capable of downloading. Yeah. So. So it's amazing, you know, and, and then we're uh, hoping to get it, you know, I think it's still a couple months away uh, to be able to be commissioned because right now, as we were talking at the beginning, you know, there, you know, the, even though it's already unfurled, you know, unfolded, the mirrors, the segments are, are calibrated and everything is okay. We still need to make sure that it gets cold enough to be able to operate it. And then obviously as an engineer, we want to make sure that it has enough energy. Mm -hmm. It is in, you know, position in the right, um, place, you know, actually to start looking at, you know, at this, the place that we wanted the telescope to be looking at and then communication system. So it takes a, a lot of process for us to be being able to say like everything is, you know, okay, go ahead and, you know, and mm -hmm. then get thumbs up and start, you know, getting the data. So, yes.
So, so the, I guess the message is we, we've heard about all these unfurling <laughs> steps, right, that happened really, really yeah. fast, um, you know, over the course of what, like two and a half, three weeks, right? That's right. Thing yes. unfurled. <laughs> but it's going to be another something like five months before the yes. telescopes start taking science data. That's right. I, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, I, I read that it was like about eight months from the time it was put in place on the... Lagrande point to be starting to get get us data because there's all these you know these uh, steps, steps yeah right. steps that you need to make sure that the machine actually is going to be able to function correctly that is you know at the right temperature that all the communication systems are working that you all your systems which are four instruments you know only four instruments that I know of because yeah. I'm quite sure yeah there's there are more. four <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to you know make sure that uh, it's working correctly and then be able to start commissioning this. The, the spacecraft, and that's when, you know, a lot of that process, you know, the scientists start, you know, getting into, you know, looking, um, specifically looking at the different stars or different places that they want to look in the sky, right? Right. And, and then start looking where to look, you know, and, uh, and then if they have to change, you know, the point of the spacecraft in a different location, you know, they can do that, yeah. So I wanted to point out, um, two of the amazing engineering pieces okay. that make the science possible. And we've talked a little bit about this already, but one of them is the, um, the sun shield, yes. which is these five layers of uh, Minor, specialized yes. material that's very, very thin um, and has gaps between it. And the, um, the job of that is to stay warm on this side <laughs> and stay really cold on this <laughs> side. And the number I saw the other day is that the temperature difference between the hot side of the sun shield and the telescope side of the sun shield is almost 600 degrees Fahrenheit over, you know, a distance that you can reach across with your arm, oh, yeah. which is an astounding difference. piece of engineering, right? Um, and that's really important because the, like we said before, the the detectors in the telescope have to stay really, really cold, cold. Yeah. and the, even the mirror has to stay really cold mm -hmm. in order to be able to see infrared light yeah. uh, at the sensitivity that it that we that we need um, and then the other is the the actual mirror or as you pointed out these 18 <laughs> mirrors yeah. and the um, the most important thing that a mirror has to do is keep its shape yeah. right and so um, as you know, um, each of these little segments of the mirror um, can be individually That's right. adjusted. Yeah. And part of the part of getting ready to do the science with the mission um, is to make sure that the shape of the mirror is accurate for um, for it to do the the science observations. So I just I just look at this and I'm floored by um, yes. the engineering that this takes because you know when you um, when you make an optical instrument, right? When you make something that has to have a very, very specific shape, the last thing you think about is starting it out, fold it up, <laughs> oh, yeah. sticking it on top of a rocket, shaking, shaking it really it. hard for 10 minutes, yes. right? And then unfurling it and aligning it a million miles out in space, yes. right? Where no one can get a wrench on it. No, <laughs> right? yes, and we cannot even go there and fix it. I mean, the Hubble, I think was, uh, service, right? When Because we, right. we were able to have, uh, we had space shuttle uh, available for us, and also it was, the Hubble was in an altitude that we can reach it, right? Right, it was in low Earth orbit, yes. basically just a, a couple hundred miles above the Earth's surface, <laughs> not a million miles, miles away. Yes, right? and so to be able to reach it is going to be difficult, right? And so a lot of the, you know, testing that we did before we put it on the rocket. <laughs> right. Had to be, you know, trying to make sure that every single piece of instrumentation and engineering actually was going to be able to survive the launch vehicle and also orbiting, you know, the, the Earth. I mean, we didn't talk about radiation, you know, it's one of the things that I, uh, just me as an engineer, being at that uh, distance, you know, miles away from the Earth, uh, it is so important because not only the instrumentation, the, this, the, Telescope has to be called, but you know the spacecraft bus, which is in this other end, you know has to make sure that you know survives radiation. When you're up outside the the Earth uh, orbit, you know you know you get radiation from the sun, but also you know when you go farther than the lower orbit, which is about 500 
well, 600 kilometers in altitude from our Earth, you start, you start getting radiation from other places, not just the sun, but right. other places. Right. Right? And so this uh, spacecraft bus needs to survive you know, that radiation and, and make sure that all the bores and all the you know, communication systems actually function if it gets hit by radiation mm -hmm. and be able to you know, function. So there is, there is a lot of redundancy uh, on the system mm -hmm. uh, because it's just the way that we do when we build hardware that it goes into space. Uh, right. You need to have if something doesn't work you know, fine. You, know, you have something else that actually will make it, uh, you're still going to be able to get the data, right, and make it work. And so there was a lot of uh, thinking about that, right? right, just to look at the, the system that is going to be able to get the data and then transmit it out, you know, the bus. So. And so you can, you can put redundancy in the, in the radios, the computers, yes. stuff like that. But when it comes to the mirror, yes, there's only one, one right? <laughs> and, so that's and the, the instrumentation's in the back, right? Yeah, there's yeah. only one of each instrument yeah. in the back. Yeah. So it's, uh, it, it, I think when they launched it, they said there were something like 600 individual little mechanical steps that yeah. had to happen in order for the sun shield to unfurl and the mirrors to unfold. Mm -hmm. But what you're pointing out is that there are also yeah. computers that have to work and yes. batteries that have to work and solar panels that have to unfold. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And be incredibly reliable that's too, right, right? Yeah. to last for years. Yes, um, especially since I think, I think we want to make it work for 10 years, but I might be wrong. Uh, yeah. I think that's the initial uh, time for this, for the James, te James Webb Telescope to be commissioned for 10 years to get the data, you know. So imagine the data for 10 years, you know. Mm -hmm. And so all that, uh, not only the telescope has to last that long, but also the spacecraft has to last that long. And that is a long, long time, you know. Batteries uh, for 10 years is, if you think about it, you know, most, most of our batteries that we use, you know, especially the... Lithium ions that we use, they, you know, after three years, they start losing their uh, right. uh, their uh, capacity, right? right. And then you they can't let, charge them as well. Right? Yes, that's right. And then after two years, they, you know, you need to replace them. Right. So thinking about you know batteries that they have to last for a long, long time, uh, it is um, it's a challenge, right? And so yes, it's definitely a lot of redundancy. But the mirror is not, and and I'm amazed. I mean, I totally. I've been following it, you know, from the beginning since, you know, it got, you know, uh, put together, obviously because of my, my previous student or intern, but just as an engineer, you know, it's fascinating to, to learn all of the things that uh, the spacecraft is doing and uh, that we have learned. One of the key things that we don't talk about too much is that once we develop these technologies, uh, NASA, what they do is we have spin-offs. And spin-offs are important to our society because uh, the technology that we use to build this satellite, sometimes we can actually use it to benefit our humanity, you know, or, or life, you know. And, and one, and that was actually, I was reading about it, one of them was the software that they used to focus the mirror mm -hmm. to have that, you know, precision pointing. Now they're using it on, you know, observe your eyes, you know, when you go to the, Mm -hmm. and they want to focus in your, in your eye to make sure that everything is okay. Uh, they're using the same software to be able to mm -hmm. do it you know, much better. And there's definitely other ones that NASA actually uh, have you know, developed uh, and then make it available for the private industry for, or society and our community so they can get the benefit of these uh, definitely uh, marble of engineering and science, right? right. So it is, it's so important, you know, NASA has developed a lot of technology that we currently are using and we don't even know. And right. James Webb Telescope has developed, you know, a few of them that, you know, currently right now we are using. And there will be more in the future because even though the technology right now that we develop, we're not, we're not sure how we're gonna use it. Later on there will be a problem where like, oh, James Webb Telescope can actually, you know, some of right. that technology, we can use it and, solve that problem. So it's very interesting on that aspect. I, I got another engineering question <laughs> for you. So you've been involved in things that have flown in space. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you worked on something that got launched and what you felt like when it was being launched? Yes, I mean, it's, it's definitely different uh, because I, 
I was working for, for SPHERES, which is a, the, a national lab in space station. Mm -hmm. And we, um, we were building, um, but the satellites were already in space, right? Uh, wow. They were actually built by MIT uh, uh, students. And, and now, you know, NASA Ames actually owned the laboratory and we had to like build batteries and CO2 tanks uh, for, the, for the satellites to continue to do, you know, technology demonstration. And so I, when we started doing that, uh, obviously the first time uh, we built batteries, it was not like, you know, five or six, no, it was like a thousand right. <laughs> battery packs for the, you know, for the space station. And um, definitely it was um, something very, uh, Interesting uh, for me because you know as, as a young engineer and start building something for you know for the space station was you know very proud But then right at this almost at the same time. I started building the first CubeSat uh, deployed from the space station uh, that, uh, that it was uh, made in by NASA and it was the first American CubeSat being deployed mm -hmm. from the space station and most of the Students that work on it were from San Jose State. I was part of that uh, group too, one of the engineers. And so being able to build it uh, and then seeing it deployed from Space Station, it was fantastic, right? Very so, cool. yeah. And obviously, you know, I was just more into like, let's put it together, work, mm. together, you know, like not so much on the science and technology, more on like the engineering, building it, testing it, making sure everything works. But, um, but it gave me a really good uh, experience on that I start looking at the requirements and working with the PIs, you know, the scientists, you know, what they want to get out of this first satellite, you know, and how do we test and validate, or, you know, the science and, techno you know, mm -hmm. and technology that we want to demonstrate. So, yeah, it was super cool. Yes. Well, what about you? What was the first time when you started looking at the telescope? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, had, I had a telescope as a kid, but ah. the first time I used a big telescope was um, there was a telescope which isn't used anymore called the Caltech Submillimeter Observatory, uh -huh. which was on top of a mountain in Hawaii up yeah. at 14,000 feet. And that experience couldn't have been more different than what the experience of using something like this is, right? Um, because it was just me and one other person uh -huh. with this telescope that um, actually the mirror of that telescope was bigger than the James Webb mirror, mm -hmm. but it was a radio telescope. It looked a lot like a, like a TV satellite dish. Okay. Um, and there we were up on top of this mountain in the middle of the night. And the, um, I still remember this sensation. Um, obviously I remember the data coming in, but mm -hmm. one of the cool things about it is that the, the telescope had to point at the thing you were looking at and then it had to point a little bit away from it and do that repeatedly. Oh, really? And the building um, actually reacted to the telescope moving. So my first, I don't know why it is, but it's kind of a, like a visceral reaction. My first really strong memory of using a big telescope mm -hmm. is kind of being sloshed around <laughs> by the building. Um, and uh, we were using the, that telescope to look at some places where stars are forming relatively mm -hmm. nearby. Um, we were actually looking at water molecules in, oh, wow. in a star forming region. And um, I ended up doing more work like that on some space-based telescopes and an airborne telescope more recently than that. So, uh, but yeah, that experience still sticks in my mind, being on, yeah. being on this really dark mountaintop in yeah. this odd place uh, with this machine <laughs> so lolling cool. me around. <laughs> that it must be cool. cool. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And the, you know, the experience of someone using the James Webb is very different from that. Um, mm -hmm. What astronomers do uh, if they want to use the James Webb telescope is they have to submit a proposal to um, the Telescope Institute. And it's very, very competitive. I Being bet. able to get time on the telescope is really tough. I think um, only about one quarter of the first round of proposals was accepted. Uh, and uh, if you don't get accepted that first time, then you have to wait a whole year to, oh, wow. to apply again. And uh, the last thing I'll say is that um, if your uh, observations are being made with the telescope, you're not involved in that on the day that it's happening. Yeah. Commands are sent up to the telescope mm -hmm. and the telescope automatically does the observations for you. And then sometime later, maybe a couple of weeks later, you get the data. You get the data. So it's, um, 
it's an amazing machine, but it's really different how s space telescopes don't give you that kind of gut connection yes. with a telescope the way using one on the ground does. That's very anyway. interesting. No, yes, it's very interesting because a lot of times I was thinking, I was thinking that you probably will be on the council, you know, with the software engineers who are, you know, looking at the, you know, maintaining the telescope and be like, I want to, you know, you guys point it out and then be able to see it, but it's not. Yeah, when, you, when it's in space, everything's pre-programmed yeah. and the data may not come down for hours after the observations are made. Yeah. So very different experience. Yes. I see that our... I, we have uh, a lot of space enthusiasts out there cool. with <laughs> questions for Michael and Ali. Cool. So I think we'll start out with a question, I think, for Michael. Um, uh, there's both a small question and then a sort of larger question I'm hoping maybe you can get at. Um, would the uh, Webb telescope be able to tell us what's happening regarding the dimming of Tabby's star? And if so, when is that planned? This is oh, from John Oakes. That's a good question. So Tabby Star is an interesting case. Um, there was a space mission called the Kepler Space Telescope, which flew, I think it was from 2009 to 2012, something like that. And its job was to survey a patch of the sky and look for the dimming that happens when a little planet passes in front of the star that it's orbiting. Yeah. That's how we discovered many of Exoplan. these extrasolar planets. And one of the stars, or sorry, one of the planets that was discovered that way um, uh, orbits a star that, uh, where the star itself is actually changing in brightness mm -hmm. by an extreme amount. And what's cool about that observation is that it was done by citizen scientists. So all of the data from the Kepler Space Telescope was made available to anyone who wanted to see the data. Mm -hmm. And a group of, you know, I, I'll say amateur astronomers um, were the ones that discovered this dimming. So there have been a bunch of um, explanations offered up for why it dims, um, having to do with the atmosphere of the star or things orbiting the star. And I have to admit, I don't know whether someone is, a, is applying to use the James Webb Telescope to do yeah. this particular observation. Um, one thing that uh, I think is important to point out is that um, because the Webb is such a precious resource, mm -hmm. and it's also a general resource in that it can yeah. look at things far away near, nearby and so on, it's not really designed to scan a small portion of the sky for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. It's more designed to pick out some targets and look at them in incredible detail and then move on to other targets. Yeah. So um, someone could propose to use uh, the James Webb to study uh, Tabby star. I'm not personally aware of someone doing that. So Michael, to follow up, um, could you uh, speculate at all on what some of the potentials are or what might be out there that we might find that we yet don't as you were talking about um, those planets earlier that were recently discovered? Sure. So. Um, one of the great things about a machine like this is that it gives us technical capabilities that we didn't have before. So it has a bigger mirror than any telescope that's been in space before. It has more sensitive instruments. They're yeah. colder. It's all, all of these amazing things. And when I walked through the, the science goals of the mission earlier, those are sort of things people know we can do, right? If you build a telescope this big, you'll be able to see galaxies like this. Um, but I'm really, really excited about what the telescope is going to teach us about the early universe. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned before that um, we'll be able to see galaxies as they were just forming. There have been other telescopes capable of seeing a few galaxies out at those distant points long, long time ago. But those galaxies are kind of the... Um, they're the outliers. They're the extremely bright ones, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like looking um, at a, an arena full of people and trying to figure out everything about human beings by looking at the one tallest person yeah. in that room. Um, and you learn a lot more by learning things about all the people, right, at different ages and different uh, parts of their lives, different experiences. Um, and so we don't really know what those baby galaxies are going to be like. We don't even know whether stars formed and then the galaxies yeah. or whether the galaxies had to start forming and then the stars. So I'm, I'm really excited about 
what the web is going to tell us about those and that's very early parts of the yeah. universe. Super interesting. So um, I have a question that's probably for Ali. This comes from Cheryl. For something so complex like the Webb Telescope, what is the process for testing the designs to ensure it works as planned in space? <laughs> That's a good question. That is a magnificent, magnificent uh, question. Well, a lot of times uh, when, like I, like I'm just want to point out the mirrors, right? Um, when we uh, build the mirrors with beryllium and we try to put them together, I mean the scientists, the engineers actually did not. The first time they designed it, I mean, they had an idea that it was, uh, they were gonna come to be, you know, a specific size and had to put the gold, because they had to put gold on it and had to uh, apply it to it, because ber beryllium, even though it's a very strong and light uh, metal, is really hard to machine, right? Mm -hmm. And so they have to create processes, you know, to make sure that it, it work. And, you know, the first time we tried it, I mean, and I'm assuming that it probably didn't work because I know that as part of the engineering, something worked but not you know perfectly. And then we try to do it again, right? And then when we have the mirror, you know, uh, we think that it's okay and done. Then what we do is that we try to uh, test it in the environment that we think is going to be on. And obviously, if you just look at this little mirror, I mean, um, of the segment of the mirror, you know. Uh, we, we, and I'm thinking, you know, myself, we probably want to shake it to make sure that it survives the, uh, the, the, launch, the right. launch, right, at a very high uh, frequencies. Mm -hmm. And then we probably want to thermal back, back. Basically, we put it in an oven and we do cycles of hot and cold for long periods of time to make sure that the gold is not going to come off or the, you know, it's not, the metal is not going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, their factor, the shape, because it gets too cold or too hot, right? And so once all that is done, then we can start working on, you know, putting, making the whole mirror together, you know, and then test it as a system, right? And do the same thing, you know, put it on a hot and cold, you know, and then vibrate it. Uh, sometimes we do chalk, you know, because uh, when uh, the, it's in, this, in, this, in the rocket, the first time we turn on the, the motors, you know, because most likely it's not gonna like fly out. It's gonna, you're gonna feel the shock of the motors, you know, mm -hmm. pushing you and then the vibration going up, right? And so we do shock. And, uh, and those are very important. There's other things that we have to do. I was talking about the radiation of the bus and uh, th that is at the bottom. And so we probably had to uh, red, you know, do, use some radiation to uh, shed some of those uh, bores and then component ships to make sure that they uh, actually are well shielded from the radiation uh, so they can function in space. And obviously, you know, the, the little uh, sun, what, what do you call it? The, the sun, sun shield? shield. Or the, the sun shield, yeah. yes. We probably had to make sure that it was resistant enough that it, when, you, when it gets pulled, it doesn't tear. So there was probably a lot of uh, pulling and rolling up and pulling up. <laughs> Uh, like an accordion, and then obviously there was probably a lot of thermal back uh, that had to be done to make sure that, uh, because it's gonna be folded under vacuum, and so you wanna make sure that after it gets unfolded uh, because of the vacuum, that the different layers don't get stuck together. Right. You know, that's or what I'm, or, yes, right. and, and I'm thinking of that just, you know, quickly, right, from the perspective of engineering. I heard one of the things that was challenging about the uh -huh. sun shield is that, um, when it unfolded after launch, it was in zero G. Yes. And it had never been tested in zero G before, right? It had yes. only been unfolded oh, yes. on, a, oh, no. on a shop floor, yes. right? So there was a little bit of. Uh, yes, you know, there was a lot. That, that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. There was a lot of. Because, I mean, we, we can test it to what we think it's going to be like, you know, mm -hmm. but really you cannot really test it until it's in space, right? Right. So we have another question that's an engineering question, I think. How does the satellite, um, how do the satellite images get communicated to the ground without interference, especially when it is so far away, asks Stephanie. Okay, so that is uh, a good question. And actually, uh, that is the reason why we put in the L2 point, which is like around it, uh, point two, uh, because it has a really good access to the ground stations on Earth. We use the deep, Nest, 
uh, deep, a deep, deep space, space network, network yes um, system which are a group of different uh, dish um, ground stations that are in uh, different places of the earth and so we get that data as this as the satellite is orbiting you know the earth right uh, is able to uh, provide information uh, probably once a day you know depends uh, when we commission to uh, to actually uh, send data, right? And we all, obviously we have to do calculations to make sure that this, you know, the radio or the antenna is facing to the ground, to a specific ground station, right? Because we want to make sure that when you are pointing to the earth, to that specific ground station, you have a point of sight, right? And so. I was thinking about how um, we think of this as being really far away yeah. at a million miles, yes. but the Voyager spacecraft are, uh, let's see, I think they're 10,000 times further away than that. Yes. And we're still able to collect the signals from that. Yeah, and, right? and that is amazing, yes. That is totally amazing. So this is actually kind of in our backyard. Yeah, <laughs> totally in our backyard, yes. Just a little bit, you know, far, but it's totally in our backyard, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, we have a question from Kathy. Um, are we going to be able to see aliens out there? So this, <laughs> you want to take it? No, you. <laughs> this, this is not a, a direct alien detection <laughs> telescope. Um, like I mentioned before, it may tell us whether there are excellent places um, to look for life mm -hmm. elsewhere in our galaxy by looking at the atmospheres of extrasolar planets. Um, but no, this is not really designed to look directly for life. Yeah. Sorry, Kathy. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us for this exciting Quick Bites uh, with Ali and with Michael. It's been a wonderful exploration of the telescope's goals and how it will be bringing us information in a few short months. It's been extraordinarily illuminating, so thank you both very, very much. If you didn't catch our entire conversation, please stay tuned for the video recording available soon on H&A in Action. Join us for our next Quick Bites to discuss the world's news.